Hey, this is Chris Jericho inviting you to the first ever Rock and Wrestling Rager at Sea. Picture this rock and roll, wrestling, comedy, live podcasting, all on the open ocean from October 27th to the 31st, 2018, from Miami to Nassau. I'm bringing Hall of Fame wrestlers, some of the greatest rock and roll bands on the planet, and putting the first wrestling ring on a cruise ship ever. Don't be a stupid idiot. Make the list. Check us out at ChrisJerichoCruise.com. Fresh off the hills of what could only be described as an epic podcast guest on the Dogcast with Chris Jericho, I get to follow it up with P.D. Williams, my friend. What's going on, buddy? How's she going, eh? Going good. You know, I went from Chris Jericho to P.D. Williams this week. And to our guest tonight as well. So, I mean... I guess it's a blockbuster week, right? You know what? I as excited as I was to interview Chris Jericho, he doesn't do a lot of podcasts. I was equally yep. as excited to talk to Sammy Callahan, who I, I've recently became friendly with. You were overly friendly with him. It was, I I think one of the best interviews we've done with Impact wrestlers is the Sammy Callahan one. Yeah, Sammy, I, I didn't know how it was going to be. Like, when I asked him, like, you want to do a podcast? Like, it was impact. Like, when I ask people to do our podcast, I'm not, like, I guess really bad at business. Um, you get those guys who are like, hey, how's it going? How's your kids? All that, Whatever you're trying to butter them up for. And then you're like, oh, yeah, you know, like, you know, I got this podcast. You know, if you ever want to do it. So, I, I don't do any of that. I'm like, you know what? People don't have time for that anymore. I think they just appreciate, like, Hey, so I went up to him. I'm like, hey, Sammy, if you got some time, do you want to do my podcast? And he's like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And I'm like, okay. I had no idea if – I had no idea how he was going to be because Sammy's like, oh, I don't know, sometimes off the wall, sometimes not. Like it, it's an up and down. Uh, I know how he talks on social media. I didn't know where, if we were going to get that kind of Sammy or if the Sammy that – I, I talked in the locker room or the Sammy we get out in the ring. I, I didn't know what we were going to get, and I was very pleasantly surprised and happy with the Sammy that we got. I, can I talk some inside baseball for a second with a conversation yeah. you and I had a long time ago when we first started? Okay. So when we first started, we were we decided we didn't want guests at first because we want to build our brand up our name. Finally, I think it was, was Uncle Jeff our first guest – or close to it, right? Um, I think he was our was first. It? I think I think Jeff Jarrett was our first guest, which we'll talk a little bit about that later. But we we after we did Jarrett, and then we did our cat because we've only had a handful of guests at best on the, our podcast here. You and I were talking about it, and I was like, "You should reach out to this guy or this guy or that guy," and you kind of had said. I don't want to bug them. As much as I want them on, I don't want to bug them. Now that we're a year and a half in, a handful of guests, several tapings, recordings, has your feelings kind of changed to reaching out to wrestlers to do the podcast? Uh, No, because, I mean, my feelings haven't changed about doing podcasts. Um, You know, and and we'll talk a little bit more inside wrestling. A lot of the interviews i do i don't set up um like either ross Foreman, a pr guy will say hey you know we're promoting this so can you do these interviews yes absolutely it's for the company and then as well as you like you kind of filter out all the the requests and like this seems like a good one you know uh, i owe this guy a favor can you do this all that kind of stuff um and still because you know it's tough even like oh uh, it's just 15 minutes, right? Well, then when I do 15 minutes, like I don't want to be driving in a car or like, you know, uh, let me step away for a second. It's like, or get, you know, I got kids, I can get distracted and stuff if they're up during the day and all that kind of stuff. So I need to set aside, I got to like structure my day around these interviews. You know what I mean? 
So a lot of the times it is an inconvenience for me, but I do enjoy doing them at the same time. So I know how I feel when I do them um, beforehand. Uh, like I have to like, calendar and all this kind of stuff. It's an extra thing I have to do. It's not like, oh, yeah, just give me a call. Um, like when you give me a call, we just shoot the breeze. That's, you know, that's, that's different. But so I feel like, you know, putting that on somebody else as well, um, you know, I, I – it, it, it's tough. It's really tough. So I guess it hasn't changed. Um, I just kind of like, I accept that we do do a wrestling podcast show. I guess, you know, we have to have interviews. Um, it's, you know, part of the nature of the beast. You accept it. You just, you, you buried the no, podcast. I mean, I, it, it's not that I accept it. It's just like, that's, it's, it's a podcast, you know, podcasts usually have guests, you know, imagine if we're like late night with, uh, you know, the Tonight Show or whatever the case may be. And, you know, I used to watch it when Dave Letterman was on because I thought he was hilarious. Imagine if he didn't have any guests. It would be like, okay, we're just watching Dave talk and do bits for all this time. Um, it wouldn't be the same, you know. So um, I like when we just sit here and talk. Um, sometimes I even forget, like, we're recording and then we're just talking wrestling and, and, and things we like and all that kind of stuff. And then when it's a guest, it's like, okay, I got to put, like, extra hard thought into this because – uh, we have to be good to our guests, kind of like when you have guests to your house, you know, you're like, okay, I got to offer them. Does he want something to drink? Uh, anything to eat? Um, all, all the, like, are they entertained? All that kind of stuff. So uh, I guess I just, that's my feeling on it. You know, right. you and I, like, you're an interviewer. I mean, that's what we do. You know, you're, you're, a, you're a great setup, man. Like, uh, you're made for this stuff. Dennis, me? I'm not. I just, it's not my my cup of tea but i enjoy talking wrestling that's that's my cup of tea it, there was a funny part before we move on to to two of the topics in the interview we have this week during the interview i at the end i don't think you listened that far where i was asking jericho you know what's it like now that you're a podcaster versus a wrestler you, you know do you it's the kind of question i ask guys who have podcasts who are wrestlers you know you're on the other side of the train tracks and he's like, yeah, I've been, I've, you know, I've been podcasting for five years. I got into it before, you know, the big boom happened. I'm like, <clears throat> I've been podcasting a lot longer than you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't, um, I didn't want to say it. I just was like, oh, five years, that's nice. Well, I mean, I, I would, I'd say he got in it during the big boom because I like when I think of podcast and like the guy that. Uh, started all for wrestlers i think Colt cabana right i mean don't you yes that's the first part when he asked me he's hey do you want to be on my podcast i looked at him like he had like two heads i'm like what 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 do we like like do are you recording this like audio video i, I don't understand he's like no just talk i ask you questions and i'm like you mean like a like a shoot interview because that's what they used to be called shoot interviews or, or something like that you know like uh smart mark videos put out shoot interviews and he's like, yeah, kind of, but you know, like you could say whatever you want. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like it was a foreign concept to me. And he already had like, um, I don't know, like 30 or 40 guests before me. And I'm like, what is this podcasting? And this was God. I mean, I don't know. This was not 10 years ago, but pretty close to it. Maybe eight years ago or so, um, where I did Cabana's podcast, I want to say. So he, he did it before the boom. Jericho, I, I would say the boom happened five years ago, like right when Jericho was getting into it. That, that's what I would think. Maybe, maybe he feels like he created the big boom. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, it looks like you were on February 6, 2014. Oh. Really? That's No. No? It couldn't have been. I was, uh, I was like right before my retirement. And I remember uh, we were at Clash Wrestling when I did uh, oh, wait, Cabana's wait, here podcast. It is. Here it is. Let's see here. Uh, March 2nd, 2012. Okay. So that was six and a half years ago. There it is. Um, Sorry, that was another site that reposted it in 2014. Okay. So, yeah. So that was, what, uh, six and a half years ago? Mm hmm So, and Jericho said he's been doing it for five. So Cabana like, really was the one that kind of, uh, started all this stuff and then that's when i started oh podcasts right and then i think the next I, I don't even remember the order they came in after that it was like cabana and then everybody had a podcast just uh for the record two years before cabana me 
<laughs> but were you doing wrestling or fantasy football? Fo- fantasy football. Exactly. But I'm just saying, yeah. you know, these guys, I was ahead of them. I might have been on a different uh, trail, but I was ahead of them. Oh, and it's very true. I mean, you were doing the podcast thing before yep. podcasting was cool. And then and it's got us somewhere, right? And That's then right. Cabana, the first one, was like, hey, why don't we do all of this stuff that people talk about? But do it with wrestling. Yeah, I mean that, and that's what started it. So it's not like he originated; it. he just kind of brought it into wrestling. I I actually was podcasting before Mark Marin, if you know uh, WTF. Uh, I've heard of that. Yes, so that's that's how I'm like I'm like an old grizzled veteran in this industry <laughs> of podcasting. A pod- and that's why you're so good at it. That's why you're so good at it. I, I remember podcasting in my mother's basement. No, not that. Ever. <laughs> back in my day, man, I say that now in wrestling, but now you say back in my day with podcasting. Uh, anyways. <laughs> I could tell you some funny stories, but that's neither here nor there. Let's talk some wrestling. Uh, we have Sammy Callahan interview coming up here in a second. Let's start with a conversation. You were not uh, there for this conversation, but I felt like it was something you and I could talk about since we were talking about podcasting. Tyson Dukes and myself, which if if people are listening and they don't know who Tyson Dukes is, PD, why don't you fill them in? So Tyson Dukes, um, he was around like when I started like 18 years ago. Um, he's been like pretty much everywhere. I remember – uh, like my first wrestling show that I've ever done and competed in, Tyson Dukes was on that show. He was in he was in a tag team match, but he used to do this dance, and it was so so over with the crowd. You know, they started off his heels, but he was so charismatic that uh, it just made the, they automatically turned to baby faces. And then um, he started doing you know jobs for WWE, and this was like before angst he was around and all that stuff. Um, so it was like, and it was almost like, uh, really like post attitude era. And I remember like Stephanie liked him, everybody. And like when they did the dance, like they loved him and they'd always come in a dark match. Uh, every single time they were in or around where he's from, which was like the Toronto area. Like he'd do Detroit, even Toledo, anything that was in driving distance, they'd always book him. And then he blew out his knee and then, uh, uh, they were, they were, I think they were about to sign him to a contract too. And he's just like a. Then he's now he's like a very technical guy. So he always has been, but very well known in Canada. Um, he's he's helped me out a lot along the way earlier on in my career. Um, so and then even at uh, one point for I think a few years he was the trainer at the Can Am Wrestling School of the Moors um, before he opened up his own up in uh, London, Ontario. Um, but that's that's just a little something off the top of my head about Tyson. So I'm not sure if the show was still going on, and I think it was still going on. We were kind of off to the side in the first set of double doors where you can kind of see the ring. You were by the VIP sitting, uh, seating over where the stage is. You know know those doors we were talking about, right? Yep. We're standing there. We're watching the show, and we got to talking. Now, he doesn't know who I am at all. He, He probably thinks I was just a backstage helper doesn't know me we were never really introduced and i still don't know if i introduced myself to him yet but we're sitting there we're watching the show we strike up a conversation and by the way tyson hi i'm dennis uh, if you listen <laughs> to this um so we're sitting there we're watching the show and we started talking about the indie scene and he kind of said uh, and i'm paraphrasing you know i, I don't know when the bubble's going to burst or the floor is going to fall out and it's all going to come crashing down. Because right now, whether you listen to the Jericho podcast or you just listen to all these indie guys, this is the best in the history of independent wrestling that the business has been. You don't have to go to the WWE anymore to make money. Social media, YouTube, uh, Twitch, they're all making stars out of independent wrestlers because people can see their work. This is... The, the time, and you can attest to this, Pete, the time we're living in now, best ever for independent, independent wrestling, right? Oh, I would uh, agree 100% because before on the indie scene, how did you get your name across? You had to, when I started on indie scenes, I mean, 
it was that time where VHS tapes were still around. I remember getting my matches from IWA Mid-South and CZW and all that kind of stuff. Smart Mark Video, they would give me a copy of the show I was on, and it was a VHS tape. And then, like, it slowly, a couple of years after I was in, like, okay, everybody's starting to put it on DVDs now and stuff. But that's how you had to get them. You had to go there, buy them, order it, go on, like, I don't even know if dial-up internet, it was still a thing, or if we're switching over to high speed at that point. I think we're at high speed, but still, like, there was, like, no YouTube or anything like that. Like, you had, like, two wrestling shows you could watch or, or three, whatever. Uh, you, it wasn't at your fingertips like it is now. And now it's like I can – if I hear about a wrestler anywhere, if you mention a wrestler or I, maybe I come across him on, on Twitter or, yeah, Twitter, I could probably put his name in YouTube and get all of his matches and then – or whatever else he's involved in or just click on him on Twitter and, like, it's right at my fingertips. Like, and I would have never have heard that guy if somebody else didn't hear about him. And it's just – it's insane now. It's insane. So before – if somebody was really creative and it makes me think how many guys that are too old now to wrestle that were super creative back then, they just never got their break. Nobody gave them a shot. And now it's like people are making names for themselves just because they're so creative and they know what to do and they know how to market themselves. And it's just, it's a, it's a crazy time we live in now. And I, I really, and the, with your, what you said there with the, the bubble burst thing or the floor falling out, I don't know if it will. You know, I, maybe I, I don't think it will. I'm, I don't think it can. I'm glad you said that because that that was my argument to him is if you look at the stand up comedy scene in the what late eighties, early nineties, it the floor fell out. All the comedy clubs were closing, things were bad. There were bad comics making a lot of money that probably shouldn't have. And I would say for almost 10, 15 years, the stand-up comedy scene was non-existent. So much so, co- the Comedy Central was based off stand-up comedy on in the early days, where there was just stand-up bits all the time, almost like the Comedy Central station on XM, if you've ever listened to it. So, you know, Once the bottom fell out, they changed their formats to kind of sitcom-y, uh, a, a, a lot different of a feel that you see now. That being said, when podcasts came along and stand-up co- co- comedians jumped in on it, that revived the stand-up comedy scene. Now these guys were building up their own fan base, the, a fan base that traveled that would show up all around the United States. Now when you book three or four guys that have podcasts, they're selling out places now. The stand-up comedy scene is thriving. There's no, there's no sign that there's going to be a bottom that will fall out. And I would mirror the two industries, wrestling and stand-up comedy, that if you start seeing the floor fall out of stand-up comedy, maybe that's when you worry or you analyze, well, what went wrong? But there are two industries that utilize podcasts, that, that welcome fans in to podcasts about their product to help build up fan bases. Uh, in wrestling, you do the same thing. Now indie wrestlers have a traveling fan base that will go to show to show to show to see this guy it no longer are the guys depending on the promotion to push them yeah i mean and and that's what they call a draw so um if say if they have a fan base and they're in the new york area and those fans are loyal to them they have i don't know like 100 fans or something like that let's just say round number and they they will willingly travel to like, you know, five hours each way of New York to see this person. They know if the promoter books that individual on the show, they're going to get $100 for, or not 100, 100 people uh, with the ticket sales, whatever they charge. 10, they charge only 10 bucks. That's $1,000. That probably covers, you know, the city guy's booking fee right there. Um, nobody charges 10 bucks anymore. So let's say 20 bucks. New York area might be 30, 40, 50 priests, like, you know, front rows, all that kind of stuff. Um, so they're getting a couple grand off this guy. And that's just – and then the other people that are like, oh, I've heard of this guy. I've never seen him before. I want to see him. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's – you're marketing yourself. And the Young Bucks did it to a T. And they are – man, they are probably some of the most successful independent wrestlers um, in the world today. 
you know, when when I see fans that will be like, oh, everybody has a podcast now. What's what's the downside about that? If you want, like, um, just yeah, I know it's it's a, it's a lot of content because now, and that's fine. I mean, it's just like there's so many wrestlers. There's more wrestlers now than there's ever been, um, and and that's that's fine too. But only so many people. There's only gonna be so much time for one person to listen to it. I I can you can't listen to every single podcast out there. But maybe let's say you listen to this podcast, Jericho's, and um, you know Stone Cold's or whatever, right? And let's say now The Rock has a podcast. Well, I don't got time for rocks, but I really want to listen to it. Well, one of us three is going to go. You know what I mean? So it's all about taking over the podcast world, too. So you're fighting for you know listeners there as well. So um, there is no downside of everybody having a podcast. I don't think so at, at all. But th- it was interesting that even today with the boom going on, that there are still some wrestlers out there that are worried about the bottom falling out, out of the industry. And I can only imagine that, and I don't know, did, has the independent scene changed much from when you were wrestling to when you retired? And I don't want to say to when you came back, because kind of when you came back was really early stages, maybe the start of the revival of the independent scene, but... Have you seen, were you wrestling when the bottom fell out of the independent scene? Um, I don't think it ever really uh, fell out. I mean, it's always been there. See, I've never been like an indie darling, what they would call them. Like where the the, the Meltzers and the Wade Kellers, like, oh, oh yeah, it's awesome. Matt. Like I've never been an, an indie darling like that. Um. But I always, I can always have a show every single week if I wanted to. Um, it's just – it's different now. Now it's so much easier to get a hold of me. It's not like, hey, you know, uh, Tyson Dukes, do you have PD's number? I want to book him. You know, because they – oh, let's look him up on Twitter. Hey, uh, give me a follow so I can DM you. And, that, like, we're done. I mean, that's, that's so easy to find somebody now. Um, but, you know, at the same time – so that it's so easier to reach out to people. Promoters can have their pick over like who they want now. It's just it's a bigger market. Like it's just such, such a big network now. Um, and has it has the indie scene changed? Um, you know it depends. Like no, I, I would say no because I've been to shows where there's not a lot of people there, and I've been to shows where there's like a ton of people there. And still to this day, I mean, if the promoter doesn't um, promote right and if they think like, oh, I'll just post everything on Twitter. Well, people scroll past Twitter really quick, too, if it doesn't catch their eye. Like you, you have to do the proper like promoting and all that kind of stuff. So um, you, you can have The Rock on the show. But if nobody's, you know, knows it's happening, you're not going to draw anything, you know. OK, that that's a very interesting outlook because I just didn't really know too much about the independent scene. I was. I was a quintessential WCW, WWE guy. I didn't really understand that there was a world outside of it until you. I started really bumming around with you and becoming friends, and now my eyes are open. I get it. Uh, don't crucify me, guys. At least I admit. No, it's it's totally valid, Dennis, because, I mean, I think, like, growing up with me, you just see what's on TV. Again, there's no internet. There's no nothing. You don't know there's something out there. Unless you hear it from a friend of a friend that somehow got a hold of a tape or went to a show and word of mouth, like maybe it didn't travel as fast or whatever the case may be. Maybe you'll, you'll run into a flyer. What is this show? Why is this former WWE wrestler on this show? What is, I don't understand this. Now you go on Twitter and you, you run across, you run across a GIF that's not WWE or, or an old WCW or any of the, it's like, what is this in a gym? What, What is this going on? So it's almost like ridiculous to think that like you'd almost have to be living like under a rock to not know there's an independent scene out there nowadays with all the social media. I, I agree. Let's move on to our next topic. And I didn't tell you what we were going to talk about on purpose because I wanted your true raw answers here. It's okay. uh, it, And this is going to be tricky because Jeff Jarrett is a friend of the show. Is is Uncle Jeff to you? He was great to us. He was our first guest. He put a, he put time aside 
the week he was being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame to come onto our little podcast at the time and talk to us. So I, I want to put that out there to the fans that you're we're not really going to bash him. We do, I I am not because he was good to us. But I want to get your perspective because there was recently a lawsuit. Uh, you and I didn't really talk about it. I just asked you if you heard about it. You said you kind of heard a little bit through the sights of what I had heard about. Can you, from what you understand, can you give me a Cliff Notes version of what you believe this lawsuit is about? Um. So... Uh... I just, from what I read on the internet, that's all I know about it. Um, you know, obviously Jeff Jarrett was not fired from Impact, but like whatever you want to call it, he was put on a administrative leave. I, I, I don't know how they explain that, but then eventually he was relieved of his duties. Okay, um, I don't know what steps he had to take with that, but during that whole time, you know, we were going through a transition where. Uh, you know, Anthem took us over. Jeff was still like the head, uh, you know, booker and we were going through like, okay, we're not going to be called TNA anymore. We're going to be called uh, global force wrestling. So I always thought, and maybe this is totally untrue. I always thought that, you know, there was TNA under Dixie Carter and there was Jeff Jarrett started his own promotion, global force wrestling. And then, you know, Dixie, you know, left the company and then Jeff came in, Anthem hired him, and I, th- I thought Anthem, like, or, or Jeff sold the Global Force Wrestling, like, uh, company to Anthem, like, the name and all that stuff. Um, that was always my understanding, and then we switched all the belts and stuff like that to Global Force Wrestling. As soon as we made all the switch, all this Jeff Jarrett getting put on administrative leave and all that kind of stuff happened. And then we quickly switched back to, okay, we're going to be called Impact Wrestling. But then we were already in the middle of launching the Global Wrestling Network app, um, where it was the, the, the stream. And uh, I, I, apparently that's what the lawsuit's over. I don't know if it's, to my understanding, it's over the name itself, the Global Force name. Even though Global Force isn't in the app, it's Global Wrestling Network. Maybe that was Jeff's name, and he's looking to sue because he owns the rights to it. But I just – and I don't know what the truth is. I don't know who owns the rights to Global Force Wrestling. I thought they were they were bought by um, Anthem, so that that's what I know. So I figured that's what the lawsuit's over, the actual copyright of the name. All right, I, I know for sure you're not sitting backstage talking to anybody about this, so I'm not going to ask you those questions. But the question I am going to ask you, from a talent point of view, where you've seen where Impact has gone, where you guys have worked hard to rebuild you know, your reputation, to rebuild connections that were broken in the past, uh, to, to rebuild talent, uh, a TV show that was almost burnt to the ground. You guys have worked really hard. Slammiversary, you came out. You're still slugging. Sure, TV ratings have been down, but show quality has been up. You guys are riding this big high wave, and then this thing hits. As a talent, is that kind of like a gut punch to you? And I'm not saying someone's right or wrong, but it almost feels like another speed bump, and you have to throw your hands up and go, Come on, guys. Yeah, I mean, like the first initial thing I thought was, okay, obviously we're in a rebuilding phase, so obviously we're refinancing stuff, right? Um, And I think I've already mentioned on the podcast that uh, we we have a lighter crew that we're working with production-wise. You know, we have uh, less cameramen or less cameras because, you know, budget-wise, anything we could do to like kind of – pinch some pennies it helps right because we're trying as a as, as a business it makes sense to to turn a profit um so when you're like okay you know we're really we're refinancing now we're, we're starting to you know get on the right track this is good um and then it's like now we have a lawsuit which could you know i don't like i said i don't know who owns the rights i have no idea who's in the right or the wrong on the lawsuit 
Um, I don't know who's going to win that lawsuit, if it's even going to get to court or if there's going to be a settlement um, or dismissed, whatever the case may be. But, you know, if that's like a, a settlement lawsuit or it goes to court and court costs cost a lot of money, that comes out of Anthem's pocket. Uh, the first thing I thought was like that could put this company out of business. That's the first thing I thought, like as a, as a talent and somebody that works there, I'm like, that could put this company out of business. Um, just because financially, you know, they don't, I, I mean, I, I don't know how it works because Anthem's just like a, a sub company of like, like, like impacts just a sub company of Anthem. So I, I don't know if they have lawyers back in it. I don't know all that stuff. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I don't know what kind of insurance they have riding on that and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that was my first initial thought. This could put the company out of the business. And, you you know, that would suck for, for the guys working there, obviously, because now they have to find somewhere else to work. Do you still feel that way to this day? Now that a few weeks have gone by, you've had some time to either digest it or think about the situation. Are you still worried or do you kind of feel like now, and not that, like I said, not that you've talked to anybody, but do you, do you feel a little bit more confident? Like, okay, win, lose, or draw, we're still going to come out okay. Well, I don't know that. That's the thing. Like win, lose, or draw will come out or okay because lawsuits cost money no matter what. Like just for have your lawyers look at them. You're paying them. And lawyer, we all know lawyers make a lot of money an hour and probably ex- Anthem executive lawyers probably make even more than that. Um, so, I mean, no. I mean, any sort of lawsuit, it's it's got to be looked at by a lawyer. There's money right there. If there's any merit to it, then it goes to all these steps of court and stuff like that, which costs money. So a win could potentially be a loss because you just spent a lot of money. So that's a loss in your pocket, right? Even though you get to keep the name or, or maybe I – don't, I don't even know if they're fighting over the name or <laughs> – man, it's so it's so complicated. You know what I mean? And then a, a loss, obviously, because then there's some sort of settlement. So either way, win, lose, or draw, um, it's it's a loss because uh, you're, you're losing – the company's losing money that they, you know, I don't know if they should have to lose it. But, but then again, you know, if you win, then you're like, okay, now you have to pay us court cost money because that's, that's a thing as well. So maybe they go down and then make their money back. Um, but at the end of the day – um, we have stuff scheduled coming up with impact. I'm still going to go there and I know every, all the other talents going to go there, work hard and just do their job because it's not their job to worry about like this lawsuit. Um, of course they're worrying about it. Am I going to have a place to work tomorrow? If for whatever reason, um, you know, it, like financially we can't go on. Uh, yeah, obviously like I'm more worried about the guys. I'll be totally fine. If the company shuts down tomorrow, or if they fire me tomorrow, because you're, rich. I will be fine. Because you're rich, you have a palatial mansion. We, I've been there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more worried about, um, you know, the guys I'm working with, because it's like, okay, you know, I know they do a lot of stuff on the indies and all that kind of stuff, but now this is another paycheck that, that they're not going to have on a weekly or biweekly or whenever they get paid basis. That sucks. Has any of the talent reached out to you asking you questions per se via text, phone call, whatever it be? No, and I haven't really reached out to any of the office or anything like that. Like, for we, there was that one. I only saw like one post on the internet that said uh, this lawsuit was filed. What like it was maybe like ten days ago, right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, it's kind of like a wait and see. Like, uh, they probably have. Uh, I mean, it's not a criminal thing, so I don't know if in civil they have like preliminary hearings to see if this can actually go to court and be. I don't think they bound stuff over, but uh, um, you know, to see if there's any merit to this that this should go on. So, um, and, and civil's civil's different than criminal. Like you know, like if if you're guilty of a crime, it's like beyond a reasonable doubt. You know that that kind of thing. Um, in civil. It's not. It's just. It's a moral thing. It's only fifty-one percent right instead of beyond a reasonable doubt. So, um, it's a lot. It's a lot different in civil. This is going to be a tricky question for you. And okay, are you uh, mad, angry, hurt, just 
confused at Jeff Jarrett? Hi. Hi. Um, no, sorry. That was uh, my dog stepped on a kid's toy. Um, <laughs> I thought it was your kid. It's always my dog. No, and now it's this, it's, it's this now, thing. Now he's stepping nuts. on everything? I don't know. He, I don't know why he doesn't want to leave my side. Probably because we're best friends. Sorry, Dennis. He's your uh, only friend. <laughs> It's your so only this is going to go off for a little bit now. Wow. Maybe I should try to smother it with a pillow or something like that. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Does that sound bad that I'm killing a, like a doll? Nope, nope. Um, Not for podcast reasons, no. I think it works good. Uh, just um, be clear. In, clear we're just, we're, we are talking about criminal charges, so yeah. ah, he smothered a doll. What kind of, um, did you see what, what PD did? Again, Dennis, I'm sorry. Did, did we you got see off what, on a tangent here. Did you see what PD did on the podcast? He killed someone. <laughs> <laughs> he killed Ch- the doll's name is Chucky, and he does have uh, orange hair. And then, uh, anyways, um, I I asked well, what what are your feelings towards uh, Jeff Jared now? Now, I whether it's innocent or not, do you still feel a little like, come on, Jeff, really? Or hey, he's got to do what he's got to do. Yeah. So now this is what this is how I look at anybody that's in a type of situation. I put myself in their shoes. Okay. Let's say I, I'm in Jeff Jarrett shoots. I created this company. I did whatever. And, you know, they they uh, relieve me of my duties and all that kind of stuff. And let's say if this is what the lawsuit's over, the, the rights in the name, let's say I still like, you know, hey, I own the rights to these names. Like, uh, like I should be getting some sort of compensation for it or I should be getting that name or whatever the case may be. Well, yeah, I would I would want what, what I created, what's rightfully mine, what I own the copyright to. I think anybody would do that. I think if you and I, Dennis, are doing this podcast um, and then somebody was like, whatever, like we own the copyrights to it and they opened up another thing that was like wrestling perspective, we'd be like, whoa, hold on. You can't do that. Like, I don't know if we'd send a cease and desist or if we're like, hey, you know, you owe us the rights because you're using our material, whatever the case may be. Well, I think anybody would do that. Well, we've gotten into Twitter slap fights with people before over use of things that we've created clearly ahead of them, uh, whether it be porn star name or wrestler's name with your wife. Uh, I believe that uh, just recently there was a... Someone passed off one of our podcasts as a interview they conducted, if you remember while we were at the tapings. I, I got angry. And it was only one site, and then a bunch of other sites picked it up from that one site. I reached out. I complained. I had fans that were kind of bashing me like, hey, man, you know, just let it be. Be happy. And I said, you know, we put the work in. If you went to work and someone else got paid for it, wouldn't you be kind of angry about that? So I, I'll say this out to the fans. I've seen a lot of people bashing Jeff Jarrett. Now... He's got a reputation. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to apologize for anything he's done in his past, and neither will he. Uh, He said it kind of before on our podcast. I'll say this. From this one thing, I don't know if he's right or wrong, but let's not bash him until the verdict is in because if it is true, he created it, and someone else you know, was profiting off of it while he wasn't, he deserves what he deserves. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then we can spin it the other way as well. Maybe, and so th- this, we've, we've, I guess in this thing, we've kind of sided with Jeff. Okay. Now let's not side with Jeff from look at it from the opposite perspective. Um, let's say he doesn't own the rights, but he's like a uh, global wrestling network, or we eliminate everything that said global force wrestling. Okay. So maybe he does own the rights. But Global Wrestling Network, maybe he feels the Global Wrestling is very similar. And maybe he created that. I don't know. Maybe he owns the rights to that little um, you know, name or something. And maybe he knows he's not going to win. But he's like, you know what? It's good enough to go to court. Uh, I'll burn a hole in their pocket. That's like you know, my most passive-aggressive thing I could do to kind of stick it to them. Maybe, maybe he has a lot of heat with the company. I don't know. You know what I mean? So I can look at it from both ends, and we just don't know which one is right right now. You know what? I will say this from a unbiased fan's point of view. Jeff's been good to the podcast. Uh, Impact's been amazing to me. 
when I look at that app and that logo, it looks exactly the same as it did when it was Global Force. It's that, and by the way, I'm sorry, it's that ugly green that, that they were using for a <laughs> short time. I, I don't mean to knock it, but I thought that green was the worst. I don't know, yeah. from a fan's point of view, I don't know if Impact or Anthem did enough in changing the name and the logo to really get away with this. Yeah, the green, I wasn't a fan of the green. Uh, the reason why I liked it, like now you could see we have the blue ropes and stuff like that. But then there's always going to be people like, oh, that's a knockoff of SmackDown. SmackDown has blue ropes or whatever. And it's like, uh, well, we can't do red ropes because, that's you know. That's raw. That's raw. And then we can't do, well, I guess we could do white ropes or black. or. Uh, I, I remember I, at one point we had, I don't even remember what color ropes we had. But um, uh, the one group we used to have called the Decay. Um Crazy Steve, who is like I think legally blind. Um, I guess when we switched the color of the ropes, he couldn't see them anymore, and he never said anything because he didn't want to complain. And they switched it back to whatever color. So I don't know, it's a few week thing. And then afterwards, like, thank you for switching the ropes back. And they're like, why? And he's like, because I couldn't see them. And they're like, oh my god, like how are you even wrestling if you couldn't even see them? Anyways, that's a little side thing about the <laughs> ropes, um, just with the colors and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's. I don't know. Maybe they said, hey, blue's a cheaper color tape than green, or uh, maybe on camera, blue looks better than green, or it, it complements more. Because cause neon green kind of is an ugly color. Sorry for those that neon green's your favorite color. Um, but we did have that for a while. Yeah, it's like, thank God you guys moved away from that. I like the color scheme right now of Impact. It's, it's nice and smooth. It looks good on TV. It Hopefully, Impact for will survive this. Maybe it's going to be nothing. Maybe we're drumming this up into something it's not, and it's just kind of a write the check, let's move on kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, who, uh, we'll keep up to date with this one because this one, as it goes on, we'll probably discuss it more on our podcast. It may be, and I don't want to tease it or throw it out there because I also feel like there have been other things out there where whether it be the punk and cabana lawsuit we stay away from because i i don't want to get into the he said she said stuff it, it that's that's not even your decision that's just something i don't want to do now i'd kill to have cabana on but not talk about that because it just it, it just seems like you're spinning your wheels in the mud although i've seen jeff get on a few interviews here and there now i might want to reach back out to jeff and be like hey would you just kind of come on and talk us through point and counterpoint of your lawsuit. But then at the same time, I don't know if he would, seeing that you're a current employee. So it's a tricky situation for us. Yeah, I mean, and if he's even allowed to talk about it. Like sometimes, because, you know, defenses have their strategy, and so does the prosecutor. Or Actually, if you're civil, I mean, I guess there is no prosecutor. It's just two people battling out at court. They both have strategies and all that kind of stuff. Um and they're probably not going to want to give it up on a podcast. I mean, at uh, least our podcast. Or- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, or anything outside of court. Cause what he says on here, he can argue and we can be like, man, he could present us facts and we could be like, man, Jeff, you are so right. Or Jeff, you are so wrong. It, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the people could think one way, but it's decided by a judge and the judge could be like, no, absolutely not. I know legal jargon and, this is how it's going to be. So it doesn't matter what they say. It's just uh, the judge is what matters at the end of the day. Do you know what's going to make me so mad? What? If Jeff Jarrett and Colt Cabana do a podcast where they talk about each other's lawsuits and it's the biggest pot podcast downloaded ever and it could have been ours. It should have been. I will be like, Petey, why did you talk me out of this? Oh, man. Um, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, but we can, you know. We can fantasize about it, sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think it's time we get on to our interview. It's been 44 minutes of nonsense. It has? Yeah. Man. Wow. Okay. I didn't even realize time flew. I just looked at my watch. Okay. Yeah, let's do this. Sammy Callahan is one of those guys as we set this up because, once again, we were in a hot, steamy <laughs> broom closet, essentially, um, doing this interview with them. It came out great. This was one of those I was excited about. 
you know, I don't know what I can say or can't say to give uh, away a little bit of his character, but Sammy Callahan, to from what I've talked to him, is nothing like the Sammy Callahan you would think you would get. Well, yeah, I mean, when we talked to him on the podcast, and you could see it, like, we'll be talking, and he'll totally, like, you know, be Sammy Callahan, but then he'll turn to me and say, be so sweet, and be like, oh, thanks, Petey, you know, like, um, so it's 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 an interesting character, so I, I think he has a sweet spot in him, uh, you know, like a, like a tender spot in his heart, I guess, if he has one, and then... <laughs> You know, he also has a Sammy Callahan character. So, um, man, and it just makes me more interested in him as a character and a person. I just respect him more. And you'll see that in the podcast, like in the interview. Um, I just respect him more as, like, his contributions to the wrestling business after after doing that interview with him. It's, I don't know, I really enjoyed it. And I said to you, I think that was one of my favorites. Um, and you're like, out of all the ones we did, I'm like, yeah, I, I really think so. Um, he just brought a, a different, he, and he was excited to do it. Like he did not phone it in or anything like that. Um, like literally he didn't phone it in. Like he was with us in person and yeah, he, he was great. He talked about the stuff that he wanted to talk about. He, well, you'll see, I don't want to give anything away. Let me ask you this before we hit play on this, uh, interview, 100%. I want I want an honest yes or no answer, P.D. Williams, on this, okay? No waffling, no wavering. P.D. Williams, give me the truth on this, okay? Mm-hmm. Would you let Sammy Callahan babysit your kids? No. Well, I, I That's a no. <laughs> That's a hard no. Dennis, Dennis, we're best friends, and I wouldn't let you babysit my kids. I'm not sure. No, I, no offense. I don't no take offense. offense to that, actually. No. Exactly. It's first off, I don't think Sammy has kids. All right. And then let alone my kids, like he I dude, he would like first off he'd scare them. <laughs> like, who is this guy babysitting us and all that stuff? Um little little side thing with Sammy. Um I'm watching the show, like it and it's like before we do our interview, and he comes up behind me and gives me like a rear naked choke, but it's really soft. He's not doing anything. And this person I don't know who it is behind me. But he smells so good. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what? It? And I turn around and he goes, that was probably the, the softest, like, rear naked choke, huh? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, and dude, you smell so good. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, do you just get out of the bathroom and wash your hands? Like, the soap was just, like, so fragrant. And I'm like, he's like, yeah. He's like, you know what? A lot of people think I'm dirty and stuff like that. But I'm actually really a really clean guy. And I'm like, see, I didn't know that about him. I look at Sammy. He spits on everything and tears everything up and blows snot and stuff. I'm like, this guy's disgusting. But he's not. He's, like, super clean. So, I mean, that's that's another thing that you you, you don't know. It's just crazy. It's crazy. I, I could see if Sammy babysitted your kids and you came home, he would have lipstick and makeup and they'd have done what was left of his hair before he had his head shaved. And he'd be like, nope, all is fine. And his eyeliner on. And yeah. like his, uh, he comes in with this barbed wire baseball bat dressed up like Sammy Callahan with this like um, bandana around his like face. Oh, man. I, you, you know what? I mean, you, you can't even ask that. Like babysit my kids. I don't let too many people babysit my kids. I don't know if I'm an overprotective father or uh, uh, probably. I don't know. But um, Sammy, you know what? That's a good question. You should ask, like, would would you allow anybody on the Impact roster to babysit my kids? Um, that I probably would. There'd probably be a select few people I would, but Sammy Callahan would not be one of them. Oh, man. who From what I've seen, who would I let? I'd probably let every single knockout because they'd just be good with kids, I think. Um. Well, well, maybe I don't not too young. If any of the knockouts scary. have kids, oh, Sue Young, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think I'd let Rich Swan watch my kids. Um, I would just because he's so musically talented. I think he could probably. Oh, he could probably just play a guitar for him and yeah. sing and dance, and they'd be like, "Oh, this is the greatest babysitter ever." Yeah. Can he make him like uh, you know breakfast in the morning? I don't know. Can I, make him dinner? I don't know. But as long but as they're like, yeah, we don't need to eat. Let's just strum along here. Yeah. Can I have eggs? How about another song? 
All right. Um, all right. Let's get, let's get on. <laughs> all right. Without further ado, it's PD and myself reintroducing Sammy Callahan in a hot closet. All right, PD Williams. We're back here, Wrestling Perspective Podcast. Another special guest you and I brought in. It is Sammy Callahan, the draw. Sammy, thank you for joining us. The specialist of guests to be adequately rated at this right now. The specialist. Hey, uh, Dennis, he is the draw. He is carrying impact on his shoulders right now. The so. specialist. The ratings on our podcast just went up because you were here now. <laughs> I know, that's the thing. That's the thing about me. Anywhere I go, I'm the draw. Hashtag the draw. How did you come up with that? Uh, it's something that was kind of given to me at AAW in Chicago. Uh, I was having a world championship reign. Uh, me, Dave, and Jake pretty much doing the same thing there that we did here. Feudal Pentagon, Feudal Phoenix. Uh, it got to the point with uh, me just calling myself the draw because when I left WWE and went back onto the Indies, they were the first place I actually showed up. And part of my voice right now, I have no voice from TV tapings this weekend from screaming so much, so uh, you can't hear me. I'm trying to enunciate a little bit better so you can actually make out what I'm saying, but uh, that kind of set AAW on storm and set them on fire. Uh, it was one of the things that brought them to the next level of independent wrestling and got people talking. Now, PD, I tried to talk you into letting Sammy Callahan shave my head on TV, like pull me out of the crowd. Hold me down and shave my head. They it said no. Still happen. They can't. Yeah, can't. We, we we. Oh, we should shave your head right now on the podcast. No, oh. it doesn't get any ratings. <laughs> we'll, simul, we'll simulcast this through a video click link, and everyone can go together. We're making history right now. No, uh, it lost its moment. No, no, it lost its. Moment. <laughs> I, lo- I love this guy. Hey, so Sammy, uh, I met you back uh, Ring of Honor days, probably like a two thousand nine ish. Yeah, um, and you were Dearborn, uh, Michigan. It was Dearborn, Michigan. It yeah. was my Ring of Honor debut. Just got released by Impact not too long ago, and I remember I knew I didn't know anything about you. You were still I know a lot about you. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, I remember that's you know, not good going over the match and stuff like that. And I'm like, who can base me? And then you were like a phenomenal base for me, doing my dives and all that kind of stuff. So tell me about uh, you, you know you working your way up from there. Ring of Honor. I mean, you hit it pretty quick, and then you went and got signed by WWE and stuff. A funny story about that. I remember actually, you're like, "Oh, uh, who can uh, who can do this Hurricane Rana thing?" When I jump out of the ring and land on someone, I had never done it before. But I was like, "This is one of my big chances at Ring of Honor." I was like, oh, "I can definitely do it. I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> yep. Never had done it before at that time." Yep. Could you ever imagine the evolution of the Sammy Callahan character from? When you left WWE to where you are right now? Uh, I knew this was kind of the way it was going to go, but I didn't know exactly how it was going to happen and how quick it'd pick up. I, I didn't think me hitting someone in the face with a baseball bat was going to launch my career into a different echelon and bring me to that next level of professional wrestling in this entire industry. But, uh, I almost got taken out by a mop. We're in a broom closet, by the way. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I don't know too much about the story. We saw the clips. Were you guys okay? Are you guys okay now, professionally? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Understandable. Yeah, he doesn't want to talk. No, I, I don't blame him. Uh, I've said it before. I've said it a thousand more times. I'm sick of hearing about it. Okay. Because the same people that want to talk all this garbage and all this trash on me about that are the same people that are riding my jock strap right now after me and Pentagon's match a couple weeks ago. Which was phenomenal, by the way. Exactly. Yeah, I thought it was great. No, I loved every bit of it. And then the upcoming uh, Mexican death match that's going to air on Impact, too. Be How dare that. Meltzer not give us five stars? Four and a half stars, my ass. What, what do you think? You're doing a podcast. What do you think podcasting with wrestlers doing their own podcast or fans doing podcasts has done for the independent or even the wrestling business? It's in changed itself? the entire wrestling industry. Now, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Uh, wrestling used to be, one, especially when I first got in it, when Petey first got in it, like, there wasn't a chance to get this much notoriety or this much exposure this quick in someone's career. Now a guy can be around for one year, mm-hmm. have a little bit of talent, but know how to market themselves and get a podcast and get YouTube and get an awesome Twitter or Instagram or whatever they need to truly break out to that next level. Now it all it takes is one clip, one clip, one gif to set someone on fire and a guy that's been wrestling for one year can be falling all over the round world at this point. Do you ever see the Sammy Callahan evolution going to a face turn? You never know. Not any one person is good or evil all no. the time in their life. You look at the worst people in the world. Uh, 
I don't really use an example because I don't want to fit, offend anyone on your guys' podcast because I actually like Petey. But think of the most <laughs> horrible human being you could ever think of in your life. Petey. Exactly. <laughs> We'll use Petey. Petey, total piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. But he's not a total piece of shit all the time. There has to be some sort of good in this person that it could be of animals, it could be of their kids, but everyone will have it, it's not that black and white. It really is like you can morph, become, you can change, you can grow. People aren't the same people their entire life, and that's how wrestling is as well. You're a man of many talents and interests. Uh, you're you're you look online and you don't see a lot about Sammy Callahan's personal life. How hard have you worked to keep that out? There's a reason for that. Yeah, but how hard is it to, in today's media where it seems like everybody knows everything, uh, they pretend to know the inside secrets, whether something's a work or how, what's the wrestling shoot. A shoot? How hard is it for you to keep what you like, what you do in your free time out of you know your Twitter account and stuff like that? I think it's that really easy at this point. Like I think it's people put way too much thought into it. But in my social media platforms, any interview I do, I put out what I want people to see. I'm not being told who to be. I'm not being told what to put out. Like whatever I want people to know, I can put out. Whatever I want people not to know, I don't put out. It's that simple. Do you think kayfabe could come back into the world of wrestling the way it was in the 80s, how protected it was? Obviously, we we know... It'll never be like 100% like that again. But now kayfabe means a whole different thing. And there's new ways of working kayfabe that no one ever thought about. Like Now like there's a whole different avenue of truly to spending soul's belief. I'm never going to give up my magic trick. That's why I look at pro wrestling. Like, all these people want to give away their magic tricks all the time, but I want to be one of the one people like... I don't know if this guy's all right in the head. I don't know if he's going to attack a fan. I don't know if he's going to spin on a cameraman. You really don't know what I'm going to do, and that's my magic trick. My magic trick is being able to actually spin your disbelief, and why would I tell anyone how I do my trick? Uh, before we wrap this up, I, I want to know, outside of winning titles and, and working for all the top promotions, what are your goals? I three national television shows right now. Who else can say that? No, no one I mean, else. Give me, give me more credit. Oh, I'm just, I know, but you Keep didn't, you didn't let me going. finish my question. I want more. You want more? Okay. Oh, I'll, I'll give him one. Okay. Sam used to watch me on TV. Now I watch you on TV. Damn, I feel like the bitch <laughs> right now. I just warm my, and it's hard to grow three sizes. Now I look at social media. What's Sammy doing today? Next you week know? on TV, Sammy's hey, coming out with a smile so of honest. roses. You created an entire generation of front foot Canadian destroying mother. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> I caught myself. I'm trying to be PC, but you spawned an entire generation of people. Like, you can go to any wrestling show in the world, and you're going to see eight Canadian destroyers, and you're the one that started them. It, yeah. And it seems like every week you go to an impact taping and someone says, hey, do you mind if I use your move on your show? And let's not even talk about that. Let's go. <laughs> I just said someone. I didn't yeah. say who. Okay, brother. Okay, <laughs> but uh, going back to my question, outside of winning championships and being on the top pr promotions, what do you want to accomplish in the industry? When you hang up your tights, you, you tie your boots for the last time, you say, you know, I accomplished everything I wanted. What are some of those things on the same Callahan checklist that you want to do? Places, people, just things you want to do. I really don't set, like, giant goals like that because I never want to be disappointed in myself. I never want to be bothered with that. I'm going to be on this journey that I'm just continuing to do what I want. I'm a very spontaneous person, but at the same point, I'm very meticulous of how my brain thinks. Like, I do certain things for certain reasons at certain times because I know that reaction it's going to garner and that's how I look at my career like I don't know exactly what my end game is but I'm going to change the business I'm going to run part of this business and I'm going to leave my mark on this business and that's all I really have to say have, about have you felt like you changed it right now 100% I think you have too but I think we're just on the, the tip yeah of just, just scratching the surface no, and Sammy I got to give it to you man you are uh, I watch you now. You are like the master of manipulating not only a crowd but like social media and stuff. Sure. And just you know, thanks Thank for you spending much. the time. Thank you. With no, us. Man, we really thank appreciate you very it. much. That We're, means a lot coming from you. Not so much to do with the glasses right now. It's looking at me. <laughs> that makes I've never had anybody feel you so much. I love this. Actually, no, I have. But anyway, Sam, uh, where can people find all your social media platforms, all that kind of stuff? 
Check me out. Twitter, at the Sammy Callahan. Same thing for Dave and Jake. The other members of OVE, at the Dave Chris, at the Jake Chris. Check me out on Instagram, at Official Callahan. And check out my uh, promotion, The Wrestling cool. Revolver. It's uh, that's good. what I like to call wrestling for our generation, by our generation. And that's uh, Twitter, at PW Revolver. Same thing on Instagram. Or check out the website, ProWrestlingRevolver.com. Sammy Callahan, thank you. No, thank you.